Thank the Lord. His goodness, his blessings to us in so many ways. So as I was planning the service today, and it was kind of like it came to me. Uh, as I was kind of just going along my way, uh, talk about childlike faith. That's huge. Because we can learn from children. How many know what I'm talking about? We can learn from children. And so sometimes as adults we can forget what it is sometimes to be, to take time to play. Right? We, we sometimes, I refer to me, I get too, all too serious with life. I mean, we get so serious with what we're doing that we can forget about spending time with the most precious time that we can spend is with our God and our family. And so no matter how, the, how bad the fishing is, it's always good if you have family, right? It's always good because you're connecting with family. Whatever the day may be, if you're gathering uh, you know, with friends or family, with church people or whatever, it's always good because we need each other. We need to help bear each other's burdens and help shoulder uh, responsibilities. Connecting is so huge. And... Uh, so these guys that Jesus had chosen to be his disciples come up with this question, you know, Jesus, hey, well, who's going to be the greatest in the kingdom, you know? Is it going to be one of us? And uh, it's at that point where Jesus begins to speak in Matthew chapter 18. You know, I forgot to sing the songs, but we'll, we'll, do, it. we'll do it later. I thought something was kind of missing. But, you know, I just turned 65 yesterday. You get to that age and you're kind of like slipping. It's okay, it's okay. It's good. Let's just, let's just go with the flow. Break up the ice a little bit. Can't just, just sense the tone. At that time, his disciples came to Jesus saying, who then is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? I got to get this out of the way. It's bothering me. Okay? Is that okay? Don't tip over now. Okay, here we go. I got I to deal with this. There, there's a tone in this. At this time, the disciples came to Jesus and said, Who then is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? I sense a tone of, you know, what do I got to do to be the greatest? I want to be the greatest. And he, he calls his child to himself and said, set, them, set him before them. He said, truly I say to you, unless you are converted and become like children, you shall not enter the kingdom of heaven. I don't, think, I don't think they were getting it yet. It was, still, it was still, what is he talking about? What do you mean, children? In another portion of scripture, they were trying to shoo the children away because they thought, they thought Jesus didn't have time for the children. Jesus has time for the children. Jesus has time for your kids. Jesus has time for all his kids. And what he's getting at, I, I really feel this, this, is, this is something that we can latch hold of. It's not talking about being childish, but childlike is the difference. Now, it's not, not hard to figure out what's a childish thing. Yeah, at my, you know, struggling over, you know, it's childish. We can expect that. But when people are growing in the faith... And we should be coming along the now and mature, maturing in our Lord. Things that used to bother us maybe don't bother us so much anymore. 
Are you, are you picking it up? You're making progress. Things that used to annoy you, maybe. It's no big deal. Let it roll. Let it roll off. That's becoming, as Paul said, when I was a child, come from 1 Corinthians 13, when I was a child, when was Paul a child? When he was immature in his faith, when he did not understand really who Jesus was, when he thought he was doing God a favor by killing Christians, he did not understand what it meant to have a relationship with Jesus. When I was a child, I used to speak as a child. And think as a child. Reason as a child. When I became a man, I, I did away with child. The same. Well, when did he become a man? When he met Jesus. That's the beginning point. When Jesus interrupted his life on the road to Damascus. When Jesus opened his eyes spiritually to see who he was. Now he becomes a man of God that he's been created to become. Every man of God, every woman of God, we're all created to become fully what he's called us to be. We may not be there yet, but we are in the process of becoming more and more what he desires us to become. Because of his good grace and his long-suffering, patient, on and on it goes, over and over and again, we don't get it, but we see Jesus just laying it out there. Even when they don't get it, he just lays it out there again. And maybe in another place, in another way, he lays it out. How many have had those times where you didn't get it the first time? And you, ran, you went around again and hit you another way in a different angle. And you start to see things coming together. So number one, conversion, as Jesus called it, verse 3, Truly I say to you, unless you are converted, conversion is not something merely we want to change ourselves. It's the work of the Holy Spirit changing you and I. The difference is it's not, because, it's not something what I can do. It's something he's doing now. He's convincing me. Conversion is the work of the Holy Spirit. Conversion is supernatural because it's God the Spirit. Changing the mindset. I was once a child, now I become a man. That's the work of the Holy Spirit. You see, Jesus promised the Holy Spirit would come, right? When he left this earth, as he was after his resurrection, I mean, even before his crucifixion, he, he quoted, he, he prophesied the Holy Spirit going to come. What's the Holy Spirit's job? We read in John's Gospel, chapter 16, verse 8, and he, who's he? The Holy Spirit. And when he, he's not an it. It's a person, a relation. You can have a relation. You can pray to the Holy Spirit. You can ask, Holy Spirit, help me to hear. Holy Spirit, help me to know truth. Holy Spirit, help me to discern what is going on. Lord, bring me the word. And see, the word. Jesus said, when he comes, when did he come? After Jesus went back, he tells the disciples to carry in Jerusalem. Stay there. Don't you dare go out and try to do anything until the Holy Spirit comes on you. And that's what we know is the day of Pentecost. By the way, by the way today is the day of Pentecost. Right? Did you, know, did you know that? What is Pentecost? 50 days after you know, Passover, death, resurrection, that, that's, that's the whole thing. 50, penta, 50. So the Holy Spirit comes, gives the power, and dwells the people that are praying, 120, they speak another language, they go out and begin to proclaim the truth of God. Healings are happening. Just like we heard a little testimony this morning. Well, God is doing things in the earth. God is shaking again. I believe, I believe for this, that in the last days, he will pour out his spirit. Let's believe God for it. Why shouldn't we? Let's believe God for miracles. Let's pray the prayer of faith. 
But his primary job is that he will convict the world concerning sin. Hey, I, it's not my job to convict people of their sin. Holy Spirit's job is to convict people of their sin. The Holy Spirit, people know when they're sinning. Right? People know. And if we don't know, then we're in trouble. God is so good to us that he convicts us of sin. So that we can fess up, change up, call on him, cry unto the Lord. Convincing people of sin. You know, there's just, there's just, there's no more condemnation for those who are in Christ, for the believers. God convicts believers. Do believers sin? Yes. Should we sin? No. But we still sin. Why did John write 1 John 1, 8? If you sin, you confess your sin, it's faithful and just to forgive you, right? That was written to the believer. In order to keep uh, an edge, keep in right relationship with God, we've got to deal with the sin issue. So if we sin, we just bring it before God. We just honestly, brutally say, Lord, and help me to change. So there's one thing to be guilty, feel guilty, feel guilty about it, but there's another thing to want to change. How many know what I'm talking about? There has to be a change of heart. A repentance is a change of heart. Repentance is to say, I, I don't want to do that. I don't want to go there anymore. I, I'm with the help of God. Remember when David had his affair with Bathsheba and, you know, he tried to hide it. And Psalm 51 describes that he's praying and he's, Lord, created me a clean heart. He's feeling, he's feeling this distance from God. He's feeling this block, this wall, until he deals with his sin. And when he confessed that sin, then he goes on to pray, Lord, make me to know your ways. And change me, basically, what he's saying. Change me. Because conversion is so important. Not just the only conversion, but to bring us to a place where we are a follower, a learner, a disciple. What is a disciple? It's a follower following someone else. Jesus is the leader. We're the disciple. Jesus knows where he's going. Jesus knows how to get there. And Jesus wants you to come along with him. Amen. Conversion has to do, ah, I, a, a small child can understand their need for Jesus, right? I, I'm not the judge of the age. But small children can get it. I think it's so wonderful because small children are not hung up over adult things. Right? They're not hung up. I don't care if they... If I, I'm going to walk down and give my heart to Jesus. I don't care what my buddy thinks here. I just, right? What does it mean to have childlike faith? Takes a child and sets, them, sets him before them. And he says, unless you are converted, unless you change your heart or the way you think that you are, think you are something, you have to come to a place like a child, you are dependent upon someone else. Right? And you are safe with Jesus. Parents also need to be a safe place for their children. That's not always the case in our world because we need, they need Jesus. But Jesus is always safe. Genuine believers ought to have a nurturing 
They ought to love on children. We ought to love on one another. We are for each other, of building up one another, of encouraging each other on. This conversion brings us away from ourselves and brings us to what others need. All of a sudden, we change our value system of what, well, I want this, I want that, I need, I need, I need, until, oh, wait a minute. I really only need a few things. Jesus says, I only need food and clothing to be happy. I don't know where I heard this, but I heard this somewhere. It's not scripture, so don't take, take it as scripture. This, someone said this somewhere. Adults are bigger people. Helping little people become bigger, big people. Did you get that? Okay. I've got to get it myself. Adult, bigger people are helping little people become bigger people. That's a job. That's our work. That's our calling. Whether you have children of your own or you don't have any children, who are your friends? Maybe they have children. And you can still say, hey, you know what? How can I bless them? How can I encourage them? Our responsibility of the church is to bring up children in the fear and admonition. That's the responsibility. The parents, we know, is probably more responsible for the parents in the church. But together, together, parents need encouragement. Parents need help from the Holy Spirit, amen? Because there are days when you don't have the answers. And you may be pulling your hair out. And you say, Lord, I don't, can't, I, I don't know what I'm doing. I, I'm beside myself. There are moments. Let's just be real. There are moments. These are gifts from God. Oh, my goodness. You know, you need a break. You get tired. We get burnt out. But above and beyond. You'd give anything for your kids. When it comes right down to it, you'd give anything to protect them. You'd do anything if they were in trouble to reach them, take them out of it. You'd do anything. But kids grow up, and they move out on their own. And you say, hallelujah. No. <laughs> no, I'm just teasing. But you never stop being a parent if you have kids. You stop parenting, perhaps but you never stop caring. See the difference? And so when your, your child is going through, going through things, you say, well, you know, you know, uh, you know just, just listen, and you can't always help them. Maybe to a, to, a, to a degree, but they're learning to walk by faith. They're learning to have some bumps and bruises. That's how they learn. And so let God be God. It's not that you stop caring. You just become a care person. You care about them and you love them. You tell them that you're thinking about them. You, know, you ask how it's going. I've learned this. I've got to be willing to stop and listen. If they sense you're too busy to listen, they're not going to talk about anything. Are you get it? I'm learning that. See, my, my phone calls are like, hi, yeah, 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 you know. Okay, well, if you're saying that, well, they, they, they know you're, you don't have the time for me. But you say, hey, how are you doing? Thanks for, you know, what, that's, what's going on? Take a little pause. That's just a little side note. Children will challenge you. Children will test you but they also can teach you to be childlike when it comes to dependency. Unless the Lord build the house. Remember that Psalm 127? Unless the Lord builds the house, the labor is in vain. You ever did something in vain, Rick? It's like, wow. Second point, T, 
teachable. How many think you feel pretty good? You think you're teachable? You don't have to ask. I don't, you don't have to ask. You know, I don't answer. There's a time where I have to say, you know, I need to be more teachable. I need to be more open to, you know, something new. I'm a kind of guy, I get stuck in my ways. You notice? It's okay to a degree, but we have to say sometimes, let's be open. What is the, what is what is the Spirit of God trying to speak to us? What is, the, what is the key now to where we're at? What is the most important thing you need right now where you're at? In your season of life, God has the key. And if it's sometimes just one word, is to trust or reach out or to call someone and bear your heart with them, we're never meant, we were never meant to be all alone in our carrying our load. Teachable has to do with, I need to grow. I want to grow. I want to be in a, in a, in a better place in a, where I was last year. I want to be more what God wants me to be. It's not earning it. It's just coming to a place where you know God has more. God has more things to teach us. God has more things for us to discover and learn in his scripture. We just don't read it once and say, well, I read the book. That's enough. I'm, I'm done. We keep reading. Why? Because the scripture is alive. Right? The word of God is active. It is, he uses it. The Holy Spirit uh, brings it to mind as we read it. If we don't read it, then we, do, we just kind of like it's buried somewhere. Now, the Psalm of Psalm 139, probably one of the more popular Psalms, there's a prayer, uh, verse 23 to 24, it says, Search me, O God, and know my heart. That's like saying to God, search me, put your spotlight in my heart, and show me, try me, and know my anxious self. It's what it's saying, help me to know what's going on in here. And sometimes we're blind to what is going on in our own spirit. But search me, oh God. What you're saying, I'm, I want to be totally honest, I, don't, I want to be teachable. If I'm going in a wrong direction, maybe someone ought to tell me. I would want, if I was, if I was going to go over a cliff or the road was washed out in the next mile and I didn't know it and I was just full bore going along, no sign, no warning, you, it was a, it's a, it's a, it's a train wreck, my kids would say. A train wreck. A disaster. But God has grace enough for us to warn us. Amen? And he's warning us in his word to stay away from things that help, that keep us from the blessing or the, the goodness to live in his best will for us. We are his children who want to know Am I pleasing to you, God? Am I pleasing you right now? Linda could relate to this. I think, I think she could. My, my sister Linda's here. My dad would, would always put $2 of gas. Right? $2 went further than it did today in his pickup. $2 of gas. Well, he was smart, smarter than I thought, because all the kids wanted to use his truck when they got older. Why fill it up? They're going to go chase off. They can fill it up. They can put the gas. If he put $2, that was enough to get him to work it back home. But 
What I was going with this is that I never wanted to hurt Dad's feelings. I, I, it would hurt. It's just like, I can't hurt his feelings. I mean, it's just like, you know, make him feel bad. So what, in a relationship with a healthy relationship is that we want to please. We want to please our, our Father. We want to please our Heavenly Father. We want to walk in such a way. Am I honoring him? Why is God so clear when he comes to kids, honor your, honor your parents? Why is he so clear? He follows it up with a promise. You want to live a long time? Kids, as he says that in Ephesians. Honor your father and mother. And it's, it's sometimes hard in a, a world that we live in that's broken. That is something very difficult. Just be real. It's, there needs to be healing. And only by God's grace. And so sometimes having childlike faith there may be times when you struggle to connect the dots or connect the reasoning, maybe some of the shortcomings you've had growing up, perhaps. Maybe someone has hurt you, and it's been hard. We need God to bring us to a place. He is ultimately, he is ultimately my father. He is ultimately the one whom I can trust. He is always there when someone else who we thought was going to be there is not there. He's there, and he remains with us. He's for us, Romans says, not against us. And if he's for us, who can be against us? Who can stand in the way of the Lord? And so God is always at work. At the beginning of this whole creation, he's been at work and still been working in the earth. He brings people, nations, his desires that everyone hears the gospel, the good news, so they have a choice. They can choose him or not. And so thirdly, Jesus just alluded to it. When first was conversion. Then he said, becoming like children being teachable, whoever then humbles himself. Humility. Huge one, isn't it? Humility is, takes you a long ways. Humility has to do with understanding your position in God. Humility understands that he gave you the gifts to do what you can do. Or he gave you the means so that you could give. Or he provided a way. Humility has to do with realizing who you really are. And it takes the spotlight off yourself. And it turns it back to Jesus. Humility needs to be in a, in a healthy way. It's not saying that you're no good or there's nothing good in me, but it's saying, but Jesus, Jesus in me. Jesus takes an ordinary person and can do extraordinary things if a person is walking in humility. And so what Jesus talked about later in his, his teaching the disciples, he says, who's going to be the greatest in the kingdom? The servant. The servant. And Jesus himself says these words, he did not come to be served, but to serve. Jesus portrayed the greatest example of humility of all time, all kind of all time. You see his life. You see him not using his power that he could have used. He, he could have 
saved himself from the cross, but he gave himself. Philippians says he humbled himself. Even being who he was, he was God. He did not regard as equality. He did not allow himself to go that direction. He went the direction because he was called to be human at that time. Therefore, we have the greatest, the greatest of all, becoming humble like a sheep, willing like a small lamb, willing on and on it goes. Humility brings glory to God. And humility sends a message to people that are looking for real things. People in this generation are looking how we live, demonstrating the love of Jesus. They want to see it. The generation today are hungry for the miraculous, whether it be God or something else. This generation is hungry. They've seen so many things in the video. They've seen, it's no big deal, but you talk about the supernatural, that gets your attention. No, we want the supernatural for God. We, we don't want the, Satan can do things too, but we want to bring God into the picture. And God wants to destroy the works of the devil, and he is doing it. And if your family is in a place where you need help shoring up, and you bring it before the Lord and leave it there. Let him do the work. Let him do the changing. Let him do the convicting. You just live your life. You sell out. You say, Lord, I'm yours. I want to do all that I can. And help me to listen. Because pride says, I can do it my way. Brian says, oh, I don't need help. I'll tell you what. We all need help. Amen? I'm not looking at anybody. We all need help. I mean, come on. We just need help. We're not supposed to do it by ourselves. It's time... The kingdom of God. This kingdom, his kingdom, come, right? His will be done. Not my kingdom. His kingdom come. His will be done on earth as it is in heaven. There's a whole host of people awaiting in heaven. The Bible says there's a cloud of witnesses. Hebrews chapter 12, or 11, actually. 11 and 12, they go together. The 11th chapter, I believe. Faith is assurance of things hoped for, things that you don't see yet. Things that you don't understand right now. They're just hard. They're just, we, we say, Lord, why? It's not that we're saying, God, I don't trust you. We're just, we're just, Lord, we need to light on this. Sometimes he gives us a little light. Oftentimes he says, just wait, trust me. Cling to me. It's going to be better. I want to leave you with one verse, final verse, that has to do with our whole reason for being, I think this could be the cornerstone verse of my own, it should be a cornerstone verse of my own life, personally. Romans 14, verse 19. So then let us pursue the things which make for peace and the building up of one another. If you live by that, you will make a difference. Sometimes it's impossible. Let me just say this. Romans also said, if it is possible, be at peace with all men. If possible, he said. If possible. 
other than then he went on to say, basically, you've done all you can, you leave it in the hands of God. It takes the weight off. It's not my problem anymore. Take the blame off. Puts the burden on the Lord. He's big enough. He'll carry your burdens. He invites us to come. Let me read that verse again. So then let us pursue the things which make for peace. And the building up of some things are just not worth arguing about. We're going to have differences. And Sometimes we have to agree to disagree. Keep the peace. Love each other in spite. See the good in each other. At the same time, we have, we have to be a guard. We know, there, we know there are people that are not good for us to hang around them. We shouldn't hang around with them. If they bring you down, don't hang around. We love them, but we are on guard. We set boundaries. Even Jesus didn't waste his time with religious people, parasitics. He just, he just spoke to them, and they, <laughs> to be a child, tenderhearted. The child knows where to go. A lot of times they cry, they know, because that's when the parents show up, right? And I'll let you do that, how you do it. You know, parenting is the hardest job in the world. It's, it's, it's just a, one of the greatest jobs. It's one of the hardest jobs. But look at God, what he's doing. He's, he's our father. Who loves us as kids. And I just want to be his kid. I want to be his kid. I want to be his, his child. He paid the price so that we could just actually come into a place of Understanding that he's not up there just to club us. If we mess up, he just wants us to look to him and hear what he's saying. That he is for you and not against you. 